I want to welcome everybody to Magna Center and the Schiller Chair in Judaic Studies here at Gordon. Thank you so much for coming uh, on this really gorgeous, almost spring-like night. Um, I am really excited to welcome you to this uh, very special event, which in my mind uh, epitomizes the, uh, the core of what Fordham's Jewish Studies program is all about. <coughs> and that is a vibrant intellectual community, rich and stimulating public programs that are um, often uh, part of a series, like our In Dialogue series, our Emerging Voices in Jewish Studies series, uh, and our the next uh, upcoming lecture this month, uh, the New York Public Library Fordham Lecture Series in Jewish Studies. Um, it also exemplifies the strengths of Fordham's Jewish Studies that examines Jewish history, Jewish culture, uh, at the intersection with surrounding cultures and in conversations with scholars from different disciplines. And it also uh, shows our uniqueness, I think, in, in the sense that we foster partnerships. We foster pa partnerships within Fordham, between different Fordham uh, schools. Uh, I'm particularly proud uh, of our partnership with the uh, law school. This is, uh, I think, our third or fourth event to uh, join together and our uh, partnership with the business school, which we're developing. But also across New York City, um, this is a, a, a program that emerged from our um, uh, collaboration, partnership with Columbia University, with uh, the Institute for Israel and Jewish Studies. And as you can see from the upcoming event, uh, we also have partnerships with New York Public Library and uh, also Center for Jewish History and other museums. So it really, it, in a nutshell, it presents what the strengths of Fordham's, uh, Fordham Jewish Studies is. So I, I don't want to take too much time. We have quite a tight program, but I do want to introduce Professor Stephen Friedman, who will uh, welcome you all on behalf of Fordham University. Oh, <laughs> Thank you, Magda. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to everyone here. Uh, these are special events because we bring into the community uh, people in the neighborhood who have been a part of what we are doing here at Fordham University uh, to create partnerships uh, across the city. I am very proud of the fact that Fordham, as a Jesuit Catholic institution, has a commitment uh, to Jewish studies. And I'm incredibly proud of the fact that the one person that's primarily responsible uh, for that commitment. Uh, the person who has endowed our first chair in Jewish studies is here with us tonight, uh, Eugene Schwibler. Eugene, it's an honor to have you. <laughs> As you know, uh, Dr. Tedder is our first uh, chair of Jewish studies. I say that because I hope in the years we'll have lots of chairs <laughs> of Jewish studies because Jewish studies at Fordham University in New York City is a really uh, important part of who we are as an institution that's a faith-based institution. Uh, Dr. Tedder has done remarkably well in the short time that she's been at Fordham. As a matter of fact, we're well on our way to form a center for Jewish studies here at Fordham. And it's the tremendous effort that Dr. Tedder has made to get us to a place where we have that foundation and we have a commitment across the university. Uh, I'm here tonight to welcome our community guests, our members of the Fordham family, on behalf of our chairman of the board, uh, Bob Vallejo, and the president of Fordham University, uh, Father Duchesne. Both of them are committed to our effort and see what we are doing here at Fordham as opening up tremendous opportunities uh, for our institution as a global institution. I'm particularly proud that two of our deans are here with us tonight. Uh, Matthew Diller, our dean of our law school. We're very fortunate to have Matthew in that leadership role. <laughs> and Dean Anthony Davidson, our dean of our School of Professional Welcome to Fordham. Enjoy the evening. 
We hope to see you on many occasions. And again, can I say thank you for your tremendous leadership. So I uh, also want to uh, uh, acknowledge uh, 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 Professor Friedman took the, my list off. Like in short, I was going to introduce the deans, but I wanted to introduce uh, Professor Elisheva Karlbach, um, the Sala Baron uh, Chair in Ju uh, Jewish History, Culture, and Society at Columbia University, who is our partner in this uh, in this endeavor of. Um, uh, the Schlitner Rabin uh, Postdoctoral Fellowship. It's a joint fellowship, it's quite a revolutionary thing, and, uh, and also a partner in the Emerging Voices in Jewish Studies series. So, Joey, as a couple. Thank you so much, all, and Professor Tenner, for that good introduction. Uh, Provost Friedman, Dean Diller, Dean Davidson, Professor Tedder, Mr. Schwindler. I speak in the name of the Institute for Israel and Jewish Studies at Columbia University, your neighbor and now partner. There's a lot I want to say, but in the interests of time, I promise to be extremely brief. Um, some of this I've said last year, but Mr. Schwindler was not here last year, so I have to repeat myself. I want to point out three historic developments enabled by your generosity and vision, which we celebrate tonight. The first is the establishment of the Schwindler Chair in Judaic Studies at Fordham and the appointment of Professor Magda Tedder as its first occupant. Mr. Schwindler, you got a bargain. <laughs> it has been a transformative appointment for the intellectual life of so many of us in New York and beyond. Professor Tedder is a builder of bridges within Fordham and across the city. One of the bridges that we built between our institutions, which symbolizes, but is by no means limited uh, to the Rabin Schwindler postdoc, uh, which we share, um, is already, and, and so many other wonderful ventures, already underway between our scholars and institutions. Just this morning, I received confirmation um, that a person with whom I've had a casual conversation about our joint ventures um, said to me about the Emerging Voices Initiative. I love that idea. And this morning he said, I've got an envelope for you. Um, so we now have an endowment for our Emerging Voices Initiative, which was formed out of there being this immense outpouring of extremely brilliant and qualified scholars who applied to become the one postdoc we had to give. We had over 60 stellar applicants. So we decided rather than calling the runners up, runners up, we would call them the Emerging Voices in Jewish Studies, and this is now taking off. And finally, I want to just say one small word um, about our this year postdoc, Dr. Mark Herman, who embodies the future of academic Jewish studies in so many different ways. Think about the skill sets and areas of knowledge that this one scholar brings to the table. Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, law, Jewish law, Islamic law. Um, so many other bodies of knowledge come together in his work. It's just been a pleasure to watch him grow as a scholar and um, I look forward to hearing him later tonight. So I, I want to now uh, turn to the speakers and introduce the speakers and the respondents. Um, we have M Mark Herman, uh, the Schwindler Rabin Postdoctoral Fellow at uh, Fordham in Columbia, who received his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania uh, with a dissertation systematizing God's law. Rabbinite jurisprudence and in the Islamic world from the 10th to 13th century. Um, he has been awarded uh, uh, fellowships from the Knapp Family Foundation, the Memorial Foundation for Jewish Culture, the Cardoso Center for Jewish Law, and the Wexner Foundation. Um, the, our respondent, uh, and again, uh, epitomizes this dialogue with other disciplines are Professor Jed Sugarman of Law, who, uh, who I am delighted to say that has both a JD and a PhD in history. 
So I'm a, a, a partisan for history. Um, he is the author of The People's Courts, Pursuing Judicial Independence in America, uh, which has been already, said, it was published in 2012 and was already been cited by the US Supreme Court in 2015 in the, uh, the case uh, Williams Yuli uh, the Florida Bar. Uh, he's also a recipient of many prizes, including the American Society of Legal uh, History, Cromwell Prize, the Joseph Parker Prize, and the Israel Perez Prize. Professor Catherine Quinney is a professor of theology, uh, and she's the director of the Middle East Studies uh, and Religious Studies programs. Uh, she received her uh, MA and PhD from the University of Chicago and is the author of two books, The Rhetoric of Sobriety, Wine in Early Islam, and Conceiving Identities, Maternity in Medieval Muslim Discourse and Practice. So join me in welcoming this really outstanding panel. presented competing visions of Revelation side by side, rarely attempting to adopt one perspective as normative. Sustained attempts to characterize Revelation in a single coherent voice only appear in the first half of the 10th century, driven by factors such as the rise of single authored works, a shift from oral to written transmission of texts, and sustained criticism of the rabbinic claim that God gave Israel both written and oral Torahs. This talk aims to demonstrate that Sadia ben Joseph Gaon and Moses Maimonides, who authored the two most influential accounts of Talmudic tradition in the medieval Islamic world, drew on ideas in contemporaneous Islamic legal thought to present the Jewish past. While Sadia and Maimonides argue that their visions of Jewish law are timeless, and emerge organically from earlier rabbinic literature, their narratives of the genesis of Jewish law were very much opposed. The Islamic legal tradition offers insight into what made each theory compelling and why each thinker chose to defend and shape Judaism in his particular ways. The origins of rabbinic Judaism were a urgent concern in the Middle Ages as both Jews and non-Jews challenged the right of the ancient Talmudic rabbis to leave Israel. Sadia and Maimonides therefore sought to supply theological and epistemological foundations for Jewish law, to rebuff the motley detractors of rabbinic authority, and to authorize themselves and their institutions to transmit, interpret, and determine Jewish law. Embedding the pictures of the Jewish past that Sadia and Maimonides painted in chronologically and geographically proximate approaches to Islamic jurisprudence, underscores that Jewish thinkers of the medieval Islamic world consistently drew on ideas from beyond the classically Jewish canon in order to fashion Judaism, uncovering a multi-layered conversation that engaged canons that we today consider both Jewish and non-Jewish. Now, this would be unsurprising in the context of medieval Jewish philosophy. Sadia and Maimonides, for example, exhibit deep awareness of philosophical concepts in circulation in the Islamic world. Showing that the legal theory of these two thinkers utilized Islamic jurisprudence aims to disrupt an artificial boundary that imagines Jewish law to be isolated from so-called outside influence. Situating the ways that leading Jewish philosopher-jurists imagined their legal systems in Islamic intellectual contexts, 
stabilizes another perennial, but simplistic or even spurious tension in medieval Jewish studies between loyalty to earlier Jewish texts and assimilation of concepts not found in that corpus. If so-called external notions nourish the legal thought of even Sadia and Maimonides, then they apparently felt no qualms about engaging various non-Jewish bodies of knowledge to help frame their tradition. Exploring Jewish and legal, Jewish and Islamic legal theory in concert also highlights that shared modes of thinking crossed communal boundaries and molded expectations of what jurisprudence should be. Jews, then, exemplify how minorities traverse their worlds, mimicking majorities and engaging multiple discourses, reconsidering traditions along the way. Finally, the historical study of legal theory problematizes a field that often imagines itself to be timeless. Stanley Fish has argued that no system of theory, be it legal theory, literary theory, or whatever, can ever fully explain a body of literature that it seeks to justify. This is because, Fish contended, any theory inevitably borrows from that which it seeks to transcend, which Fish views as an impossible goal. Study of medieval Arabic language legal theory likewise lays bare that no theoretician ever accounts for all of what preceded him, but instead emphasizes, minimizes, or rereads elements of his tradition as he sees fit. <coughs> medieval legal theory aspired to answer pressing societal questions. The same is likely true of contemporary jurisprudence. Although Jewish sages and leaders of all periods are often titled rabbis, it is useful to distinguish, to distinguish between the rabbis of the Mishnah and the Talmuds, who lived between the third and seventh centuries, and their medieval heirs, more appropriately termed rabbinites. Medieval rabbinites competed within the Jewish community with the Karas, a diverse movement that shared an antipathy toward the leadership of the Talmudic rabbis and the authority of their <coughs> extra-scriptural tradition known as the Oral Torah. Most Jews in the medieval Islamic world were rabbinites, but the specter of charism nevertheless grew large. Sadiq the Own and Moses Maimonides might be considered the most influential Arabic-speaking Jews, in the sense that others engaged their ideas, read their writings, and celebrated their legacies. They had much in common. Both were communal leaders, read widely in Arabic thought, and were outsiders to the places that they came to call home. Sadia was born in Egypt and flourished in Iraq, and Maimonides escaped anti-Jewish persecution in Cordoba and settled in Egypt. The larger political situations in which they lived were markedly different. Sadia settled in Abbasid Baghdad, capital of an empire that at one point stretched as far west as modern-day Tunisia. There he became a Gaon, head of a Talmudic academy that declared itself to be the transmitters of centuries-old rabbinic tradition. <coughs> Maimonides lived in Andalusia, in Spain, at the other end of the Islamic world. Local Islamic and political and cultural forces profoundly shaped Andalusian Judaism. Like the Umayyad Caliphs in Cordoba, Spanish Jews attempted to establish independence from Eastern authorities. The 10th century caliph, the Cordoban caliph, Abba Rahman III, built palaces and gardens to protect his power and patronized Jews and Christians, scholars have suggested, in order to cultivate a distinct politi political identity. Andalusian rabbinites embraced this support, and Maimonides carried the legacy of this community throughout his life, even insisting that his Egyptian-born son write in Andalusian script rather than the Egyptian one. Maimonides also brought a sense of independence to Egypt, battling Baghdadi Jewish authority regarding the leadership of the Jewish world. And here you see the, so we, the major sites of the, what we'll be talking about. Both Sajid and Maimonides agreed that God authorized the rabbis to promulgate Jewish law and reveal at least some of the rabbis' traditions. They profoundly disagreed about two crucial questions. One, how much divine data does rabbinic literature contain? And two, 
What role does humanity play in interpreting and applying divine law? Briefly, Sadia asserted that revelation was all-encompassing, downplaying or rejecting human supplements to divine law. But Maimonides narrowed revelation's scope, celebrating the rabbi's role in generating Jewish law. Scholars have long looked to ascertain why Sadia and Maimonides offered such different views, usually turning to internal Jewish events and beliefs. <coughs> Many have read Sadia's claims for the divinity of the, of the rabbinic tradition as a reaction to Karaite denials of the authenticity of the oral Torah. Accordingly, what Karaites foreswore, Sadia embraced wholeheartedly. But this line of reasoning is deeply problematic, in part because it assumes that polemical needs led Sadia to disingenuously adopt perspectives that he knew to be false, a counterfactual belied by Maimonides' own desire to combat, combat terrorism. Correspondingly, many have assumed that Maimonides' positions emerge as a compelling way to read the Talmud. However, this also fails to account for the discordance that later Jews uncovered between his thought and the Talmud. Furthermore, the many concurrences between the thought of Maimonides and his non-Jewish contemporaries suggest that the Talmud was not the sole impetus for his ideas. J. Harris and Moshe Halbertal focus on the interpretation of vexing aspects of the rabbinic corpus as central to the thought of Sadia and Maimonides. Harris argues that the nature of rabbinic legal midrash, scriptural interpretation that often appears to be fanciful and distant from the meaning of the Bible, constituted the central issue in medieval treatments of the oral Torah. On the other hand, following Maimonides, Halbertal foregrounds the omnipresence of disagreements among the Talmudic rabbis at Pivotal, focusing on Sadia's assumptions that the rabbis <coughs> forgot particularly, particular traditions, and Maimonides' idea that disagreements arose while interpreting divine texts. <coughs> in my view, the issues that these scholars highlight emerge from attempts to address larger theological and epistemological problems. The critical topics for Sadia and Maimonides instead were the scope of revelation and the nature of mankind's, the rabbis, roles. As Sadia saw the rabbis as primarily charged to transmit tradition, rabbinic midrash could not generate law, and forgetfulness or other errors may cause debates. Maimonides, though, assumed that God had charged the rabbis with expanding revelation. Therefore, Midrash obviously creates new laws, and debates arose as interpreters read these texts. These assessments did not emerge in the vacuum, or through detached rumination on Talmudic thought. Nor could they, given the burning challenges to rabbinic and rabbinic Judaism. Rather, Sajit and Maimonides participated in debates about revelation and the interpretation of revealed texts that all jurists in this period addressed. Sajid's surviving writings do not set forth his, his thoughts on the oral Torah in a systematic manner. Scholars must therefore reconstruct his views from incomplete works, quotations in later writings, and texts preserved in the Cairo Geniza, such as this one. As a result, Sadia's statements are occasionally unclear, or even somewhat contradictory. I believe that his presentation turns on three concerns. One, the scope of revelation. Two, the role of the rabbis. And three, the origins of extra-scriptural institutions. First, the scope of revelation. Sadia maintained that God revealed all of Jewish law to Israel. Drawing on a terminological and conceptual distinction in Islamic law, he proclaimed that this included both the usul, roots or principles, and, and the peru, branches or, or details of the law. He asserted that ancient figures transmitted the rabbinic Mishnah and Talmud long before they were written, just like the prophets before Moses transmitted God's earlier revelations before their inclusion in the Torah. He further postulated that God must have explained every commandment. Therefore, oral tradition must cover any details absent from Scripture. As a corollary, Sadia allowed the oral Torah to alter the apparent meaning of the written Torah, comparing this to the use of reason to re reinterpret anthropomorphic descriptions of God non-literally. Sadia insisted that Deuteronomy's description of God as a consuming fire cannot be literally true. 
Similarly, he, he argued, the oral Torah reduces the maximum number of punitive lashes from Kipter's 40 to 39, and expands the prohibition against cooking a kid in its mother's milk to forbid all mixtures of milk and meat. The role of the rabbis constitutes the second central issue. Sajid repudiated the notion that rabbinic midrash, scriptural exegesis, created law. Instead, maintaining that the rabbis, quote, matched, received laws to their own creative reading of scripture. Harris describes this as a stunning break with the rabbis. But focusing on what Sadia affirms, rather than what he denies, will allow us to take him on his own terms. Sadia supported his views by echoing earlier Muslim positions that had rejected the use of kiyas, which we may loosely translate as human reasoning, to expand divine law. Sadia repeated the claims of the 9th century theologian Ibrahim al who had contended that logical inconsistencies in Revelation preclude attempts to understand, let alone expand it. Sadi noted incongruities in scripture to illustrate this, such as the self-contradictory laws of the red heifer, arbitrary differences between men and women concerning divorce, and a prohibition against murder by the imposition of capital punishment. If the divine will is so inscrutable, he asked, how can inter any interpreter <coughs> new rules? He accordingly ascribed scriptural interpretations found in rabbinic literature to unnamed ancestors, located their origins in a lost prophetic age, and pronounced the rabbis to have been almost exclusively tasked with transmitting traditions, not initiating them. The notion that ancient rabbis had forgotten tradition or committed errors in their transmission fully accords with Sadi's approach, and surely was not meant to disparage the rabbis, as Maimonides later took it. Sadi considered rabbinic debate to be the to be a product of the role of the rabbis, a product of the rabbis' role as transmitters, as human messengers, not immune from error. Mistakes could enter tradition after the period of revelation. Sadi's techniques of reconciling traditions utilized methods developed by Muslims who sought to reconcile conflicting traditions ascribed to Muhammad or the early Islamic community. Like his Muslim contemporaries, Saadi suggested that disagreements among transmitters are not genuine disputes, but instead reflect temporary misunderstanding, incomplete transmission, or misinterpretation on the part of later figures. As a contrived example, a letter from a student of Saadi proposes that one person might hear of an obligation to pray three times a day, another four, and another five. This would result in dispute if each figure fails to realize that the rules each apply in a different instance. In this case, Jewish law mandates three prayers on weekdays, four on the Sabbath, and five on the Day of Atonement. Unlike modern interpreters of the Talmud, who often celebrate rabbinic disagreements as a sort of proto-pluralism, Saadi argued that debates developed due to errors, tasking later generations to restore the original truth of revelation. Lastly, Saadi consistently based extra scriptural institutions on prophetic authority. He asserted that God revealed the post biblical festival of Hanukkah to Moses. He claimed that the rabbis identified new months based on calculations revealed at Sinai and not on the appearance of the new moon, an assertion that flatly contradicts the Mishnah. And he maintained that Moses himself had known about the requirement to add a second day to the observance of one day festivals, scriptural festivals a practice that the Talmud is ascribed to doubts that arose regarding the calendar during the Jewish exile. Sadia offered the somewhat circular argument that Moses must have known about the Second Day of Festivals. Had he not, its observance would violate the scriptural prohibition of adding to the Torah. Interpreters of Sadia have long ascribed such stances to anti-Karism. While Karites criticize each of these practices, this interpretation fails to consider why Sadia defended each in similar ways. What else might account for Sadia's consistent appeal to prophetic authority? If anti-terrorism was perhaps necessary but emphatically not sufficient to motivate these claims, the logical place to look for triggers would be Islamic jurisprudence. Sadia clearly exploited arguments developed by Muslims, such as his elimination of human reasoning and the creation of legal norms, or the idea that later jurists can successfully reconcile conflicting tradition. 
More importantly, structural similarity between Rabbinite Judaism and Islam, Sunni Islam in this case, that developed in the 8th and 9th centuries allowed for cross civilization of ideas from one tradition to the other. In the first generation of Dr. Muhammad, the Quran was certainly dispositive. But questions arose regarding topics about which it is silent. 8th and 9th century figures used a variety of tools to tackle these problems. Some terms of tradition, known as hadith, described to Muhammad or, the, or his earliest followers. Others assumed that the practice of the city of Medina were the best guarantor of prophetic authority and prophetic tradition. Others held that Rahi, considered opinion or legal rulings with the element of human reasoning, could supplement or even replace received sources. Others invested, others vested authority in scholarly intuition. And others still adopted a pietistic reticence to answer questions absent divine dictates. Jurists in the 9th, 8th and 9th centuries did not adhere exclusively to revealed material in deciding law. In this period, the term sunnah, which came to mean authoritative practices of Muhammad and become the byword of Sunni Islam, referred to practices of Muhammad, the early caliphs, or other ancient customs. The Quran itself most often uses the term sunnah to refer to God's actions towards wayward peoples. Battles between the Ahl al-Rahim and the Ahl al hadith those who endorse the qualified man-made law, and those who champion the use of traditions, testify to a lack of consensus in this period concerning the essential nature of Islamic law. And even those who preferred traditions over human reasoning were inconsistent in tracing those traditions to Muhammad. Instead, they, they endorsed prophetic practice alongside the practices of early companions or successors, the first and second generation of Muslims, or other figures. Scholars have identified a dramatic shift in Islamic jurisprudence in the writings of the 9th century itinerant jurist Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i, who was born in Gaza and active throughout the Middle East. Shafi'i produced one of the first theoretical justifications of Islamic law. He insisted that only revealed texts, be they the written Quran or oral tradition described by Muhammad, constitute acceptable legal sources. He thus limited the concept of Sunnah to Sunnah al Nabi, the Sunnah of the Prophet, or Sunnah to Rasulullah, the Sunnah of God's Messenger, and attempted to reject as much as possible traditions attributed to non prophetic authorities. He further aimed to protect the use of oral tradition from its detractors. For this reason, many have argued, he adopted the unconventional position, opinion in the history of Islamic jurisprudence that divine abrogation, that is, the cancellation of one divine decree for another, may only occur within one body of traditions. So oral traditions may rescind oral traditions and written traditions, only written traditions. They explain that were it possible for the Quran to annul a hadith, one might maintain that any Quranic source should prevail over any related oral tradition. Such reasoning, Shafi will read explicitly, could render hadith entirely extraneous. Shafi further restricted juristic consensus as a source of law, apparently because that too lacks a divine imprimatur. Shafi recognized the divine text, either the Quran or prophetic hadith, cannot answer every legal question. Quoting the Quran's rhetorical question, does, does man think that he will be left without guidance? He sought to clarify the permitted modes of derivation from divine texts. He presumed, or at least hoped, that he could, could answer every legal problem, but he acknowledged that jurists must occasionally infer from these things. Shafi thus shunned a more ad hoc legal reasoning and limited permitted kinds of reasoning to specific modes of interpretation. This revolutionary perspective on Islamic law did not triumph immediately, but became standard, more or less, over the 9th and 10th centuries. Whereas Shafi's contemporaries continued to say hadith ascribed to non-prophetic figures, the dominant thinking about Islamic law came to assert that God alone, through written or oral revelation, authored Islamic law. In the words of one contemporary scholar, Muslim jurists aspire to, quote, salvage the authentic memory of the prophetic age and delegitimize later accretions to the law. Jurists did allow for certain types of human reasoning, but they condemned earlier methodologies as insufficiently guided by revelation. Sadi's insistence that God was the ultimate author of Jewish law echoes these assumptions. Rather than a knee-jerk to reaction to terrorism, Sadi joined a broader shift towards positioning religious law as divine not human science. He invariably buttressed his discourses of legal authority exclusively with earlier Jewish sources, but also translated ideas found in writings of many Muslims. These, these 
commonalities in, lang in language and in framing, I suggest, are the inevitable result of competition for adherence and shared intellectual and technological input. As I mentioned at the outset, we should not judge Sadia's theory solely against the contents of rabbinic literature, even as we recognize that his postures about Midrash, or the origins of Hanukkah, and the Jewish calendar are sometimes strained. He was certainly aware of the Mishnaic distinction between biblical and rabbinic law. He obviously knew that some laws in the rabbinic corpus are explicitly marked as rabbinic decree. <coughs> Tellingly, his successors in Baghdad and North Africa nevertheless largely adopted his vision of Jewish law, and one must turn to the opposite end of the Jewish world to find a different <coughs> approach. Moses Maimonides discarded nearly every aspect of Saadia's depiction of the oral Torah, implicitly and explicitly. Maimonides was deeply interested in the nature of the scope of revolution. One prominent scholar described him as obsessed with the topic. Unlike the case with Saadia, the picture of Jewish legal thought that preceded Maimonides is somewhat more robust, and numerous Andalusian texts prefigure aspects of his statements about Jewish law. In what follows, I will outline the contours of his jurisprudence and isolate a few relevant strands of earlier Jewish and non-Jewish thought in Islamic Spain. One could read Maimonides' presentations of Revelation as a point-by-point -point rebuttal of Sadia. And Maimonides certainly had Sadia in mind when he, when he formulated his own views. To take the three areas that most concern Sadia, Maimonides significantly reduced the body of revealed material to be found in rabbinic literature, celebrated the idea that God empowered <coughs> to interpret revealed law, and argued that non-prophetic jurists produced extra biblical institutions and reached new binding legal decisions. Sadia's depiction of Revelation centers on sorry, Maimonides' depiction of Revelation centers on two polarities: a distinction between Moses and later jurists, and a parallel distinction between the transmission and creation of legal material. Regarding the first, Maimonides stipulated that revelation of the law was a one-time event granted to Moses, an individual of unsurpassed prophetic prowess. That event occurred at Mount Sinai, when God revealed the written and oral Torahs. Maimonides defined the latter, that is the oral Torah, as a restricted set of traditions that buttress and interpret unclear passages in the written Torah. He consistently defined the term oral Torah in this narrow sense, not as all of rabbinic literature or even all of the legal dicta of the rabbis, but merely the particular sets or set of interpretations that God provided Moses regarding ambiguous statements in the written Torah and a few other laws. Later jurists stand on the other side of this polarity. Maimonides insisted that figures, that these figures could only generate law using their intellects. Biblical prophets, after Moses in his picture, never instituted permanent changes to Jewish law by revealed means. And after Sinai, even Moses himself built on the Sinai kernel of the law using human reasoning. Maimonides defined any post Sinai enactment or reading of scripture as rabbinic, that is, not of divine status. And he wrote that figures from Joshua to, to Pinchas, of Moses' re revelation until Rabina and Rav Ashi, the so-called end of the Talmud, utilized their minds in a consistent fashion to produce legal data. He even intimated that this practice continued in his own day. The transmission and creation of legal material constitutes the second critical polarity in Ma Maimonides' sacred history of the <coughs> past. In his view, God charged each generation with a dual responsibility, faithfully transmitting revealed law alongside the man-made norms of earlier jurists, and drawing on both categories to produce new norms. Maimonides defined this activity as a kias, using the exact Arabic term that Sadia had associated with improper derivation from divine law that Sadia had associated with Karaism. Where Sadia asserted that the Talmud constituted a received tradition, Maimonides defined the term Talmud not as a particular book, but as a process, marked in part by, quote, deducing conclusions from premises and developing the implications of statements. He further described the rabbis as the people of Kiyas and the people of speculation. Sadia would have been horrified. Maimonides drew on formal logic to describe the way the rabbis had operated. He employed an Aristotelian division between demonstrative and dialectical syllogisms to describe rabbinic legal midrash. Demonstrative syllogisms in Aristotle's system 
are based on clearly established facts and produce knowledge considered unassailable. But, dialect, by, but dialectical syllogisms are based on mere conventions, and their conclusions are less certain and therefore subject to disagreement. Maimonides compared legal re rabbinic legal reasoning to this low, the lower level of knowledge produced by dialectical syllogisms. For this reason, he explained, disagreements inevitably arose among the rabbis in the process of interpreting the real text. A simple example just illustrates how Maimonides imagined rabbinic debate to have occurred. <coughs> the book of Exodus charges that if a fire destroys a neighbor's field, repayment should come from the best of his field, i.e., the most valuable real property. The inevitable question that the rabbis debated was, to whom does the word his refer? To the victim or the culprit? Maimonides categorized such cases such as this one as damir, using a, a term from chronic exegesis that means incomplete or a, word, or a word that requires a supplemental object to be understood. He thus accounted for the, for the debate about the source of the repayment. The rabbis simply disagree about the record of the word his. In this conception, debate is inescapable, as no text avoids ambiguity altogether. This reappraisal of rabbinic disagreements served as one of the touchstones of Maimonides' rejection of Sadi's views. Rather than a black mark on the rabbis, disputes testify to their use of their minds to understand divine commands. Several long-standing traditions in Andalusia influenced Maimonides. Three in particular merit highlight attention. Highlighting these trends should not obscure the novelty of Maimonides' presentation, but merely put on display elements that he engaged in order to develop his own doctrine and uncover his, how his earliest readers probably understood them. A well established Andalusian interpretation of the Talmudic idea that a sage is greater than a prophet exemplifies the first such contribution to Maimonides' claims. As Karaites noted in polemics against the rabbinites, this dictum, a sage is greater than a prophet, appears to rest on the presumption that a sage is created, but a prophet is merely a passive transmitter of revelation. In fact, the 10th century Iraqi Karaite Yaqub al-Kitasani cited this very adage to argue that if the rabbis were purely reflexive reporters of divine law, as Sadia argued, they could not possibly be the sages that they had praised. The 11th century Andalusian rabbinite Isaac Ibn Ziyad was the first post Talmudic thinker to attempt to recover this phrase. He argued that sages are greater than prophets because sages, and by analogy, ancient rabbis, expand divine law through their intellectual faculties. But prophets only report what God reveals. Ibn Ziyad further argued that it is only reasonable that any command, especially one from God, be communicated to those who can exercise their natural abilities in order to extract deductions from the tradition's principles and, ex and extend branches from its roots. Maimonides could not have put it better himself. A number of uh, Andalusian rabbinites repeated this ex explanation of the phrase, the sage is greater than prophet. Other Jewish thinkers in even Gia's orbit also extolled the use of Gia's in the reasoning of Ra'i, more speculative elaboration of norms in religious legal settings. To do so, in the Islamic world at this moment is particularly striking, as by now, most Muslim jurists sharply distinguish between le legitimate Qiyas style reasoning and less textually substantiated Ra'i reasoning. Islamic jurists in Spain, however, only belatedly cast aside Ra'i. The Maliki school of Islamic law, which came to dominate in, in Andalusia, remained exceptional in this regard. Biographical, dic biographical dictionaries describe jurists of Maliki, Spain, in the 10th and even 11th centuries as extolling the use of Ra'i. One 11th century court of jurist, Imel Gavar of, of Portobi, explained that he sought to integrate this attitude with more standard methods, methods of Islamic legal thought. This evidence points to a venerable tradition of Jewish and Muslim thinkers who allowed for human reasoning in the manufacture of legal norms. The second factor, behind Maimonides' presentation, relates to the political and intellectual situation, situation, which by Maimonides' time had drastically changed as the Umayyad Caliphate gave way to smaller principalities, and then two North African dynasties, the Almoravids and the Almohads. While the latter are best known in Jewish history for persecution and forced conversion of Jews, <laughs> modern scholars have suggested that some of the legal ideas of their founder, Muhammad ibn Jumar, influenced Maimonides. 
in which Umar was concerned to return to the sources of religious law and to connect law as directly as possible to revealed texts, a tendency evident throughout Maimonides' work. Sara Strumsa has characterized this attempt to go back to the original basis of religious law, common to Maimonides, even to Mark, and even Rush, to whom we will return shortly, as fundamentalists, in the sense that the fundamentals were of primary importance. Third, Maimonides' proclamation that human reasoning should endeavor to explain ambiguity in real text, as in the example of the phrase, the best of his field, that I cited earlier, echoes the writings of the contemporary Cordovan philosopher and jurist Mohammed ibn Rush, also known by Latin name Averroes. Many have compared, and I see they have made a statue the same in Cordova. Many have compared these two thinkers, who both exhibited the influence of Aristotle, held common positions regarding political theory, and shared much more. I am unaware, however, of any work that compares their legal theories. Like Maimonides, even Rush posited that disagreements between earlier jurists arose in the course of studying divine texts. The structure of Ibn Rush's magnum opus, the Diet of Mishtayid, known in English as the Distinguished Jurist Primer, testifies to this assumption. For each legal problem, Ibn Rush enumerated a range of legal rulings, cited the relevant supporting sources, and isolated the ways that jurists reached their differing conclusions. Those who have compared the legal writings of Maimonides and Ibn Rush usually compare this work, that is, the, the Gedaya, to Maimonides' legal compendium, the Mishnah book. But in light of the above, Maimonides' earlier commentary on the Mishnah appears to be the better object of comparison. One of the features of that work, the commentary on the Mishnah, which Maimonides underscored in his introduction, is the unremitting search for the causes of rabbinic disagreements. Reminiscent of Ibn Rush, Maimonides frequently explained why each rabbi reached his conclusion and how that rabbi read the earlier legal text. Chronological proximity may preclude direct influence, but it appears that both thinkers drew on a robust Andalusian tradition of legal thought that sought to locate the causes of disagreements among earlier jurists. Recent research into this tradition has uncovered its unique Andalusian components. Unlike Muslim jurists in the East, who were content to, to just list divergences, Andalusians systematically asked why a particular position was adopted often answering this question by identif identifying ambiguities in real texts. Like the case of Sadia, Maimonides' later readers subjected Maimonides' perspectives on revelation to shallow criticism. Most attacks centered on Maimonides' assertion that rabbinic midrash, by and large, contains non real law. The 13th century jurist Maimonides demonstrated that this attitude is difficult to read into much of the Babylonian Talmud. Other critics uncovered additional challenges to Maimonides from rabbinic literature. In fact, the predominant reading of Maimonides by the 17th century had him accepting that laws produced by Midrash are biblical in status, not rabbinic. For the historian, this debate demonstrates that neither the views of Sajid nor Maimonides were obvious from the perspective of the rabbis, and that other considerations likely encouraged them to reformulate, to formulate their theories in the ways that they did. A variety of factors come together to produce any intellectual revolution. Reading Sadia and Maimonides' presentations of revelation in their respective Islamic contexts should not obscure other considerations. For example, Sadia and Maimonides' institutional positions undoubtedly stimulated their depictions of Jewish law. Sadia stood at the head of an ancient Jewish academy. It is no surprise that he upheld the continuity of tradition, and Maimonides and Andrews and Brethren undertook to defend their independence from Baghdadi authorities. It is probably not coincidental that the Andalusians endeavored to authorize rulings by well-educated experts outside of Baghdadi institutions. By putting Sajid and Maimonides in dialogue with Islamic legal thought, we can better understand their theories on their own terms, why their assertions were compelling to them and their immediate readers, and why later interpreters often struggled with their ideas. Jewish historians, especially <laughs> those who study the pre-modern periods, perpetually oscillate between emphasizing internal Jewish debates and events and non-Jewish intellectual and political developments when seeking the primary causes for changes in the Jewish past. <coughs> the story that I told tonight hopefully demonstrates that such a distinction is somewhat rudimentary. 
as Jews and by extension others, were simultaneously in dialogue with many Jews. Sadia and Maimonides made use of non-Jewish thought because it helped them translate Jewish tradition into contemporary terms. They needed to present the theories that matched epistemological assumptions, what some call a horizon of expectations, that were shaped by factors larger than themselves. As these jurisprudential theories moved to the center of Jewish ideology, methods and attitudes first found in Islamic authors became fundamental to Jewish self-understanding. Notions developed by Muslims to navigate their own tradition helped Sadia and Maimonides think through rabbinic Judaism. These two jurists operated at a great distance from the hoary antiquity that they strove to explain and recover. As a result, they needed to provide Judaism with an ideology that made sense in their day. Thank you for the invitation to comment on this terrific paper uh, and terrific project. Um, it's really a deeply important project uh, to, and, and more important now than, than ever, I'd say, to do the real digging and to reconstruct and revive the history of interfaith dialogue. Uh, so I really appreciate Mark Herman's project, um, and there's something really uh, significant about this moment, um, and I, I hope it's a, 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 a kind of still continues to be a very fruitful uh, project that will foster more dialogue. We were talking beforehand, and, and uh, in the conversation we were struck by, well, what, you know, why isn't there more work uh, about this? It seems like there are such deep connections. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, great that, uh, it's great that this digging and, and explication is happening now. And I also think it's important, and I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna focus on three different uh, questions. Um, one is I want to encourage Mark to incorporate more of the legal background that sets the stage for this. I wanted to talk more about the DIMI status, D-H-I-M-M-I, -M -M -I, which I think is such a core legal concept in Islam that sets the stage for this kind of interfaith dialogue. I'll talk more about that in a second. Second of all, I want to offer some suggestions uh, so that he can bolster this thesis. And third, I'll talk about what I learned that relates to American so first, um, uh, I also want to take a step back and say I love this idea of the of I think Am Kias, the people of Kias, um, which is the people of speculation. Uh, that sounds like a home for me. We, we need more. I'm someone who I, I feel like I'm a mem I'm a uh, member of that tribe, of the people of speculation. And I think the people in your dialogue all share that ethos of speculation. That we need more space to speculate to leave space for doubt. And pluralism. I think pluralism is based on a recognition that we're all speculating. Um, uh, and I also like the, the idea that the word chaos also sounds a little bit like chaos. I think we should embrace that as well. Um, so that, I want to first turn to this concept of the dimmy status. And I'd like you to actually um, incorporate that into your project more explicitly. Um, because the dimmy status was uh, the legal protection for non Muslims in the Islamic world. Uh, and the, the word literally means protected person, uh, reserved for the people of the book, uh, reserved for Jews and Christians as monotheistic religions of the book. And not just book, I also think there's a, a, an idea that there's writtenness and also that there's a legal culture. There's something valuable to the, in the Islamic world of the fellow, fellow legalists out there committed by books and stories and narratives that generate law. Robert Covert would have a lot to embrace about this, this notion here. Um, now, it is true that Dimi status was second class citizenship. Today, we think of second class citizenship as being a bad thing. In the time of the, of medieval, the medieval world of civilization, second class was better than third class, right? Second class was better than non-citizenship. And second class citizenship was also better than dead. Um, so when we think about that in, the, uh, in comparing the Islamic world to, let's say, some of the Jewish experience in the Christian world, the Islamic, the history of a thousand years, it was far better to be a Jew in the Islamic world than to be a Jew in the Christian world, right? And we, I think we've erased that or forgotten that. And that's actually a really important thing when we really, there's too much dialogue in America, there's too much monologue in America about what is inherent to the Islamic world that is wrong, right? It's, it's, we need to emphasize that if you have a, historic, a long term historical view, there's a lot to emphasize that was, in, that was uh, fundamental to the Islam Islamic world about this Dimi status that we should um, empower. So, Brad Lewis in the Jews of the status of the Dimi 
was, quote, was for long accepted with resignation by the Christians, but with gratitude by the Jews, right? But, the, and the, but then the rising power of Christendom and the radical ideas of the French Revolution caused a, a set of, uh, a changed view of discontent among Christians living in the Islamic world who wanted to change. Okay, so I also think this crosses over into what resonates for me. We just read two parshas in, in, uh, out of the Torah in the last couple of weeks. One was the uh, was Parsha Yitro. Yitro is Moses' father-in-law. So one thing that's remarkable about that story is that Moses listens to his father-in-law. That's really that's also a great uh, role modeling uh, uh, for us. But it's not just that he listens to his father father-in-law. He listens to his Midianite, his non-Jewish father-in-law, when he establishes a system of courts, a system of delegating authority. Um, and it is then it's that system that, that Yitro imparts to Moses. Um, that is also the same Parsha, and I don't think this is accidental. Later in that Parsha, the Aseret Dibrot, the Ten Commandments are given. So it's the Parsha that is named for a non-Jew is the Parsha that we read week by week that, not coincidentally, is also where we get the Ten Commandments and the, and, and, um, the, the first stages of the most dramatic stages of Revelation and law giving. And then the next Parsha that we just read Mishpatim means laws. And in Mishpatim, we learn that there should be one law, a chukat echat, for you and the stranger or sojourner in your midst. So both in Islam and in the Torah, there is a sense that we have to have one law and citizenship that you treat with equality those in your midst. Um, so there is that resonance there. Okay? So it's also important to recognize that the Muslim world spread Greek philosophers broadly while the Christian world kept Plato and Aristotle locked up in a scholastic ivory tower. There was more free-flowing idea of the, of the Greek philosophers in the Islamic world that then gets spread uh, by some of the scholars uh, that Mark talks about. And it's, in some ways, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment owe more to the Islamic world's spread of Greek philosophers than the medieval Europe's dark ages, right, where those, where those uh, Greek thinkers were really sequestered and removed. So this is so I think that to embrace that idea of the uh, the Muslim the Islamic world's uh, generation of and preservation of philosophy for our world is something that I think most people don't uh, don't realize right I think that's also an important part of our story in, in 2018. So then I want to shift to my second topic, which is um, that I want to make some suggestions to bolster uh, uh, Marx's thesis, and some of this is some questions that I still have. I think there's a big question here. Um, and the big question is, how much is this, uh, at, at a moment in time, dialogue between Islamic and Jewish scholars, or how, versus what I think also is animating the story, which is it's endemic, it's inherent to a legal culture where there is a moment of revelation in the past that we ascribe, that's prophetic and that's sacred. Over time, these cultures all manifest this challenge. Um, how much of our legal system is based upon that past revelatory moment that we describe as sacred, and how much is uh, animated by human uh, I interpretation. So as the law gets in applied and interpreted to the present, are the new interpretations human, or are they divine, or are they mixed? Um, were those interpretations given in that original moment? Yeah, I use that word original in a law school <coughs> intentionally. All right, we're, I'm going to get back to this in a minute. So, so I think the notion that God gave an entire legal code to a prophet in a single moment, in a single founding moment, is going to challenge anyone's faith. Right? Practically, that seems like a, a, difficult, uh, a difficult and heroic moment to be able to take down an entire, I mean, all the tractates of the Talmud must have then been delivered in that one moment. It's a long time to stand on the top of the mountain. Now, Religion is a valid leap of faith, so we, we want people to take that leap of faith. But I guess the, the question I still have is um, how much of this is in, um, Jews and Muslims working through that problem like many peoples had before this moment and after? Um, and how much of this is, is interactive dialogue? So, so first of all, I think um, Mark is attentive to the idea that there is an internalist or intramural explanation for Sadia and for, for Sadia Gaon and for Maimonides. Sadia, uh, as Mark explains, the standard interpretation is that Sadia Gaon was reacting to Karaites. 
And um, he also explains, he acknowledges that Maimonides is also engaged in his set of ideas because he's trying to foster um, rabbinic authority and independence from Baghdadi rabbis for, the, for rabbis to keep this process going and to, embol and, and to empower it through being um, sage as opposed to prophetic. I think that I, it's good that to acknowledge that. Um, but I think the, the problem that I'm still asking is, um, is that how much of this is endemic to Judaism and Islam that they were doing at the same time. Because keep in mind, in the Christian world, Christians also deal with this problem of how much is human versus how much is divine. So uh, one example is that I see a lot of re re uh, resonance <coughs> between the, what I learned from Mark about the Karaites with what I also know about Protestantism and an emphasis on individual individual reading of Bibles and individual interpretation. It seems like in the Christian world, there's a Karaite connection to, to Protestants. Not that Karaites talk to Protestants, because they were separated by hundreds of years, but that they both inhabited a religious tradition and reacted to it because it was an endemic kind of problem. So Catholics and their learned tradition seem to me, as an outsider, to have a lot of resonance with, with Maimonides and a scholastic tradition of, uh, of, of philosophy and uh, that gets passed along. So, so the, uh, an example here is that this existed in the, these, these problems existed in the Christian world. It also seems to me that these problems also existed um, in, um, uh, in, the Jew, in the Jews of Christianity, and they had similar responses. So um, it's not obvious that this was a flowed out of Islamic conversation. So for example, Ramban Nachmanides, uh, the, uh, which Mark, Mark also talks about him, he's a 13th century rabbi living in Christian Spain. Now, Nachmanides seems to also have, I, I don't know enough about the details here, but it strikes me that even the rabbis in Christendom dealt with this problem in some similar ways. So, so Ramban, Nachmanides, said the Torah itself was given at Mount Sinai, but God gave the interpretive and hermeneutic principles, not the entire law, but at least the principles and methodologies for generating the legal interpretations later. So it's sort of a middle position between, uh, between Maimonides and Saji Gaon, um, but it was dealing with a similar problem. And I'd also note that the, uh, the rabbis before uh, Maimonides uh, dealt with this issue, and, and, and I appreciate that Mark circulated um, the paper by, uh, by the chapter by Moshe Habertal, because as I was reading his paper, I thought also about the story, one of my favorite stories from the Talmud, the Tanur Shel Achnai, the, this is the story of the um, of this strange oven, um, and so so how did the rabbis deal with that problem? So this is the story of the uh, from Baba Metzia. Um, one day, Rabbi Joshua and Rabbi Eliezer were having a debate about this um, this oven. Eliezer brought he would, uh, brought uh, Rabbi Eliezer brought all the evidence he possibly could to argue, but Rabbi Joshua rejected him. And upon being rejected, Rabbi Eliezer said to Rabbi Joshua. If the halakha is with me, if the law is, is with me, then let the carob tree prove it. Right? Finding authority in the carob tree. Right? And to which the carob tree that uprooted itself and moved 100 yards. Some say 400 yards. Rabbi Joshua responded by saying that one cannot prove anything by the carob tree. Rabbi Eliezer then said to him, well, if the law is with me, if the halakha is with me, let the stream prove it. And to which the water responded by flowing in the opposite direction. There's a, uh, okay, so then the next thing, Rabbi Eliezer, Eliezer said, if the, uh, oh, oh, Rabbi Joshua said, one cannot prove anything with the stream. Rabbi Eliezer then said, if the halakha, if the law is with me, then let the walls prove it. Right, now we're getting somewhere, right? And they said, well, the, the walls, then um, the walls began to cave in. This is upping the ante. We're not talking about trees moving. We're not talking about the walls falling in on all of the rabbis, threatening their lives. Um, and that then Joshua rebukes the walls, stop it walls, by saying that the walls had no authority in a legal debate. Um, so then the walls then just <laughs> went to happen, right? Because they couldn't decide which rabbi to go with. Them. Finally, Rabbi Elish said, if the law is with me, then may it be proven by heaven. Um, and in response to this, a voice came down, a bat kol, a voice came down from heaven and said to Rabbi Joshua, why do you argue with Rabbi Eliezer? The, the law is in accordance with him in every way. And then Rabbi Joshua says, to back to that divine voice, the heavenly voice. Lo the Torah is not in heaven. We take no notice of heavenly voices. Meaning, we're gonna ignore God at this moment. The law is the rabbis and not God's. Um, and, so that, uh, and so the Torah, uh, uh, the heavenly voice then exclaimed, 
my, my children have defeated me, my children have defeated me. And after this, Rabbi Eliezer was excommunicated from the group. Now, the part of the story that people don't talk about is then Rabbi Eliezer shed three tears, and for each tear was a drought and a plague on Israel. So in some ways, this first story is sort of the, is the, um, the constitution of 1787, right? It's about democracy. It's not about um, a divine inspiration. It's actually about the rabbis and debate, and, and it's some, I'm, I'm, I'm being a little ahistorical here. But it's, it, it's, a, it's the idea that we have a majority rule by a uh, lawgiver. Um, the second part of the story is about how we should treat each other even if we disagree and we should respect. It's more like a Bill of Rights, if you will, the story about the tears. But the larger point here is that the Talmud itself, the rabbis were dealing with this problem uh, way before interaction, way before Islam. So, so this raises, I think, a couple of concerns. Uh, that I wanted to suggest. I would like, Mark, um, if you could explain more, with more detail, about how the texts reflect dialogue. So for example, is the word, is, when you emphasize the word kias, it comes from Islam, but are they borrowing the word, or can you uh, help us see that they're also, bar not just borrowing a word, but borrowing a methodology, borrowing something deep. Because it's understandable that they would use similar words, but were they really in conversation, or is this just a lexicon, or is this just the borrowing of words? Second, I think the attention that you give to Averroes, um, you suggest that Averroes influences Rambam, but that I still have a, some doubt or speculation that the story may also be that Aristotle is so important that it's actually Aristotle who is influencing Averroes on the one hand and Rambam on the other, and it's not obvious to me that, that, that the arrow goes between the two of them. So I'm just encouraging a little bit more there. And then I've got uh, just, I think there's something that you emphasize here, uh, the, this line from Maimonides, the sage is greater than the prophet. Now, I don't know a lot about Islam, but that sounds like inconsistent with core Islamic ideas. To say that a sage is greater than the prophet, at least to an outsider, sounds like that's potentially blasphemy about Islam. So that doesn't seem like borrowing from. It actually sounds like, um, a, a counter distinction. Like Maimonides wants to say we're Jews, not Muslims. Uh, at least that's how I it's, that's how I hear it. I could be wrong, but I I, I encourage you to um, to address that. Okay. So um, so finally, uh, I'm going to just say this briefly. I think there's a lot that resonates with me about American law, about originalism versus living constitutionalism. Um, uh, Rambam sort of uh, I, I think is an example of common law constitutionalism, the evolution of a judicial precedent. But in, in, as I read your paper and then, and then prepared for this talk, I realized that uh, today I find more inspiration from what I see you talking about with uh, Nachmanides, with Rambam. That today I think where I see the, a logic, I see something that um, resonates with me about this, this uh, balance of originalism. That the text and context of Revelation or the founding moment of 1787 matter a lot. But also, we need to have inter human interpretation in the 21st century. How do we strike that balance? I think that there's, a, uh, there's something wise about Ramban saying, Nachmanides saying, we, the original law was divine. But then rabbis have to then humanly apply that law. But we need to be faithful, in both senses of the word, faithful in Ramban's religious sense, but faithful in a legal sense, to the principles and methodologies of the founding moment, that they understood, the founders understood, that they were writing a constitutional text, but that text would not have all the answers. They knew when they used words um, that were ambiguous, that they were punting to a generation of humans to apply them in the future. But I think it's important to recognize that those original moments, the text matters, context matters, and we have to be faithful to the methodologies, whether that methodology came out of Mount Sinai or came out of uh, uh, Muhammad, or came out of Philadelphia in 1787. So thank you for all of this inspiration in many ways. I think it's a terrific project, and I look forward to learning more from different style of presentation here from the last. I need my podium and my paper. There's a reason why I'm not a lawyer, so. <laughs> um, thank you, Professor Herman, for your wonderful paper. It was so well written, um, such a convincing argument. It was such a joy to read. 
In an age where dialogue exchange and even conversation seems stunted and even taboo, the idea of mimicking and engaging discourses offers us all a welcome breath of fresh air. Um, this paper made me think of, a, of so many different issues, and in the spirit of dialogue and exchange, I'd like to offer up um, a few responses, um, some in the form of questions um, for us to collectively ponder, perhaps. Uh, so this is not a critique of anything that was presented, but hopefully um, it will open some of the, the door to further discussion. So let me start with some broader points, and then I'm going to narrow the focus down a little bit, and I do want to end with a more technical question about the notion of PS, which uh, was raised by Professor Sugarman as well. So I'm a huge fan of comparative approaches. As you note, ideas do not emerge in a vacuum. Um, in my own work, I'm very much interested in how people construct their worlds. And oftentimes that construction is done in dialogue and conversation with others. Um, so it's very much a, a, an, an approach that I'm um, fascinated with. I was particularly taken by your statement that Jewish thinkers of the medieval Islamic world consistently drew on ideas from beyond the Jewish canon to fashion Judaism. Sorry, I think that light just went on. You continue to note that this proposition is unsurprising, especially in the context of medieval Jewish philosophy or theology, where presumably such intellectual exchanges were very common and widely noted and analyzed in scholarship today. I was very curious about that as to why we see these kinds of studies in philosophy and theology, but not really in terms of law. Um, so I was wondering what might account for that fact. Um, first of all, at least in medieval context, I don't think that law is really so closely separated from theology or philosophy or medicine or anything else for that matter. Um, and so it was peculiar to me that it would be considered as a separate form of analysis because everything seems to be mixed. Um, certainly we see in your placement of Sa uh, Sadia and Maimonides within their uh, respective context how, for example, um, Mutazilite views would have come into play. Um, and certainly uh, you sort of see evidence for Mutazilite and Asherite views uh, coming into their conversations and yet they're using them in ways that seemed to me anyway, as an Islamicist, very unfamiliar. Um, so I was very interested in how uh, law and theology and philosophy were all sort of connected. I also had the question too about Aristotle um, in that uh, you know, many of the Greek thinkers, Aristotle, um, Hippocrates, Plato, and so forth, were all part of the mix as well. And what um, at least a lot of the scholars in the Islamic context are dealing directly with Aristotelian argumentation. Um, you see that in particular among um, the Mutazilites, for example. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, to, to what extent are, you know, is the, is the dialogue more of a trialogue or, you know, even if we bring, if we're talking about Baghdad, we may be bringing other groups um, into the conversation, including Zoroastrians or Manichaeans or Christians uh, as well. And so the dialogue circle gets wider and wider. Um, so I was sort of interested in, in hearing what you might have to say about other conversation partners. Um, but getting back to the issue of, of law um, and why we don't see these kinds of comparative analyses in the, the realm of law, um, again, I was wondering sort of what, what might play into that in terms of, um, of Jewish studies more generally, um, why law is sort of isolated and separated off from theology and philosophy um, where people seem more free or, or um, more willing to engage in those kinds of conversations. Now I was also quite fascinated with your broader sense that your study of law will show how minorities traverse their worlds. Both Saadi and, and Maimonides experienced their minority status in very different ways and I was hoping you would have fleshed that out a little bit more Maimonides, for example, may have uh, undergone forced conversion before he was able to escape the uh, al muhad or the al muwahhidin um, rule in Cordoba. Um, and there's some debate about whether or not his family had been forced to undergo conversion to Islam um, under the Muwahhidin. Um, and so the question is, you know, how that experience would have shaped his later interactions with Islamic law. 
Um, one might expect as a result of that experience that he would have been unwilling to adopt the jurisprudential framework from his oppressors. Uh, and in fact, the opposite seems to be true, right? He embraces uh, many of the ideas of his oppressors. Um, so this wasn't this, the case, and that seemed quite extraordinary to me. Um, and in fact, later on in his career, he sort of um, you know, picks and chooses from different types of Islamic thinking. Um, you know, he draws from the work of Ghazali, for example, um, not directly from the Ismailis, but certainly you can see some influence there. Uh, and so his, his relationship with the Islamic world, I think, is a very complicated one and one that we would do well, I think, to incorporate into our own society today. Um, the idea that Islam is not a monolithic entity, right? There isn't a singular Islam out there, but there are multiple Islams. And the fact that uh, someone like Maimonides was able to accept some aspects of Islam and reject others, embrace um, you know, different people's understandings of, of revelation or theology or logic, but then reject uh, other Muslim perspectives, I think is, a, is an important lesson um, that we can take from this. And it would be interesting, I think, to explore what he does accept and what he does reject. Um, and as a traveler, I think a lot of um, <coughs> philosophers and, and thinkers of this time would have encountered multiple Islams and would have interacted with them in different ways. Um, Saadiya's status as a minority was less traumatic, one might assume, in Baghdad. Um, he seemed to have a pretty good standing there. Um, and I was wondering how their disparate experiences as minorities might have impacted the way in which they thought about um, the human role in terms of interpreting revelation. Um, Saadi was much more conservative, we might say, than, um, than Maimonides, who uh, wanted to exalt, I think, human, um, human logic, right, and, and uh, human intelligence in understanding um, the revelation. Okay, I was also interested in thinking of uh, minorities further. Um, how might minority critique and dialogue affect majority rule? Um, I would have liked to have seen more about what Jewish thinkers had to contribute to uh, Muslim thought in their various contexts. Um, the influence seemed to be going in one direction in the paper, and I was wondering, you know, certainly in a dialogue, right, there's, there's influence and impact going in both directions, and I didn't get a good feel on the Muslim end of things of what that influence um, might have been. And uh, again, I think um, you know, people defining themselves over and against others in different ways, uh, embracing different aspects of the other, um, those are always interesting questions in terms of thinking more broadly about this idea of exchange. Um, and that made me think more generally about notions of assimilation um, and the desire to, oops, and the desire to protect uh, a distinct identity um, that play, right, between assimilation and the desire need to preserve distinctiveness. Um, you see it throughout the works of both, um, but again, in, in different ways. To what extent does a minority group wish to assimilate, right? Um, where do we find those sort of softer areas of, of give and take? Um, with assimilation, it's obviously you know, there's certain aspects of our, ident our identity that we're willing to let be absorbed by the majority uh, community. There are other aspects we need to preserve. Um, and so detecting patterns, I think, uh, in that light would have been really, um, really fascinating. Um, finally, I had a few questions in terms of your use of both Ratty and Piaz. Um, I understand those terms, Ratty in particular, to refer, at least in the Islamic context, it, seems to refer more generally to sort of free intellectual thinking, um, whereas Piaz refers primarily to analogical thinking. Um, in my own work, I know when I was studying wine, for example, um, the Quran prohibits the consumption of wine, which is called khamar, um, and it prohibits wine specifically. And the question among early legal scholars was, um, well, what is it about wine? Is it is it is Hummer uh, prohibited because of the ingredients that make up the Hummer, or is it prohibited because of the effect, that is, um, the, the, the drunkenness that it causes? 
Um, so in terms of, you know, as Islam grew, right, um, there were other substances people encountered, right? So does wine, does Khmer include a prohibition um, against beer? Um, or does it, would it include a prohibition against certain kinds of drugs or um, pot in the Yemeni context? Um, so the question is, is well, if it's, in, if it's just the ingredients, then no, it doesn't, because through analogical reasoning, right, you're not extending the ingredients to beer, which is made of another substance. Um, but if it's drunkenness, then we can extend by analogy, right, the, the revelatory uh, prohibition in all kinds of different directions. Um, so the, the kiosk um, term has a very restrictive sense um, and is used much more restrictively in that way than ra'i, um, which was, you know, coupled with uh, it, uh, different forms of ishtihad, right, that it was all um, thought to be uh, problematic because humans are using their own sort of intellectual uh, reasoning to come up with conclusions that may have fallen outside of the revelation. Um, whereas kiyas, extending through analogy the revelation, you're not tampering with it in any way, you're just extending it. Um, so I was wondering, you know, thinking about the ways in which um, Sadia and Maimonides were using kiyas, um, I was a little bit confused in the paper as to what the difference was or if they had, um, as Professor Sugarman suggested, if they were employing it in in different ways or um, in similar ways and, and to what purpose, I guess, were they, were they using it? Um, so again, thank you so much for your paper. I really enjoyed reading it and um, thinking about it and I definitely enjoyed being here. Thank you. Of other commonalities. And when you're thinking about the Islamic world, 
we shouldn't necessarily think about Islam, but the larger in their society, and there's a lot of debate about how to change the view, the larger society does not work. And my sense is that if viewed that way, you see a lot of, uh, you see more interaction and dialogue. And, and similarly, um, when you have the, when you, when you view it as a unit of, let's say, tourists or philosophers um, instead of human influence, you see a broader, you, you, you get a broader sense of how what we now call religion is only one component of a much larger set of thinking. And so if we remove sort of, if we remove the religious affiliation from our papers, then we see them in dialogue in a new way. And that sort of helps us, especially in societies that are so strongly majority liberal, especially in fields that are so conservative in their ideology or their form, such as law, which is communicating ideas that tries to repeat the past and is invested in the idea of precedent and the past, and sort of by bracketing those the bondage sources, you can see the contemporary the contemporary um, dialogues a little bit sharper. That's what I've been sharper for you. And um, there's a lot more here. Uh, I probably I, I don't I hopefully those two issues are able to get to broader. We have time for one question or pressure for time, so yes.